Good day. Welcome to Bible Class Topics. We're looking at Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his second letter. We've entitled the series Strength to Serve, and we, today we want to look at chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. It's the entire chapter. There's three themes here in 2 Corinthians. First, Paul explains his ministry. He did that in chapters 1 through 7. Then Paul encourages their generosity in chapters 8 and 9. And today we want to begin the last of the three themes, Paul enforces his authority. We've entitled chapter 10, The Warrior, Attacking the Opposition. We'll see three themes in chapter 10 through 13. These three themes are Paul's behavior both in and away from Corinth, and he bookends these chapters. In chapter 10, he, he mentions this, and in also chapter 13. His imminent visit to Corinth, mentioned in chapter 10 and 13, and his use of his apostolic power for their edification rather than their destruction also chapter 10 and also chapter 13. We'll see Paul attacking the false teachers that have already been mentioned with vigor. We cannot tell exactly who these rivals were, but Paul certainly paints them in an uncomplimentary picture. First, we'll look at the false apostles. We'll notice them. He calls them false apostles, I should say, in chapter 11. He calls them ministers of Satan in chapter 11. And intruders come in from elsewhere, also in chapter 11. So we'll be getting to that, uh, Lord willing, in our next lesson. Three points of contention. Paul revisits three critical points of contention that he previously addressed in the first letter. The style and substance of his teaching, his refusal of financial support from the Corinthians, and the unacceptable way the Corinthians compare and judge spiritual leaders. I found these uh, three points outlined in a work by Brian Peterson. Overview of chapter 10, the key verse, 18, For it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. We'll look in the first six verses at Paul's conduct in the Lord, then verse 7 through 11, his authority in the Lord, and then verses 12 through 18, Paul's work in the Lord. We've called this chapter the warrior attacking the opposition, but we have to understand that any time we set ourselves up as a warrior for Christ, we have to understand, and I've just said we have to understand three times now, we must be a warrior in gentleness and sweet reasonableness of Christ. The word for gentleness has the idea of the midpoint being too angry, and never angry at all. In other words, the midpoint between being too angry and never being angry at all. Paul wants them to know he's not carried away by personal anger, but he's speaking with the strong gentleness of Christ. Let's get into our reading. I'm reading from the ESV as I usually do in this study. And we'll look at verses 1 through 6. I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against someone who suspects us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Apparently, the Corinthians have made charges against Christ or, more likely, his critics, uh, perhaps from outside the church at Corinth, have made charges. Well, apparently, they charged Paul with being bold in his letters and a poor creature in their face-to-face meetings. In other words, he was willing to be strong in his absence but weak in his presence. Paul makes it clear that they do not want that he does not want to come to them with the full force of his presence. Let me read that again. Paul makes it clear that they do not want him to come to them with the full force of his presence. You know, letters often convey attitudes that would not be displayed in person. And in our day, emails and social media posts often take the place of letters and can have the same negative effect. Paul, however, claims he would not write anything he was not willing to say to their face. It also appears the Corinthians had charged Paul with having human motives behind his conduct. Paul answers that his motives and conduct come from God. God is his guide and strength. Paul uses the word flesh here in two different senses. In the ordinary sense, the physical sense, we walk in the flesh like any other human being. He also uses it to refer to the part of human nature that guides us toward sin, the essential human weakness of a life without God. So even if Paul is a man of flesh, he does not allow his fleshly appetites to guide him. Two significant points are made here. Number one, he is equipped to destroy human wisdom and pride, and subtle cleverness will never win in the long run against simple sincerity. Paul speaks of bringing every intention into captivity to Christ. Christ had an amazing way of taking things that belong to unbelief and subduing it for his purposes. Jesus wants us to use our qualities, our abilities, and our characteristics for his purposes. His invitation is for us to come to him as we are and then let him refine us. What of Paul's conduct in the Lord? Well, he brings us Jesus the great gift that he just mentioned in chapter 9. Paul also brings us and his readers a Jesus type of service. Certainly, the fullness of the Lord's love and sacrifice are indescribable, but we can describe limited details of his character, two of which the Holy Spirit brings to Paul's mind here. What a shame that someone would consider Paul weak simply because he was meek. The false teachers are clearly applying fleshly, worldly standards and measuring Paul's skill and credentials. We have got to make sure we don't fall into the same trap. We have to be careful when we accuse a brother. The consequences of wrongly accusing a sincere brother include discouragement and pain associated with this, discouraging others from respecting that brother's work, and we set an ungracious standard for our own judgment. We have to be careful when we accuse a brother of anything. 
Paul first corrects their judgment, telling them to judge from a spiritual standpoint and now lays out his plan for dealing with their error by showing them that this will not be a worldly war. First of all, the realm. Yes, it must be handled here, here in the world, but it will be handled differently. Paul is not going to campaign. He is not going to try to win a popularity contest. Paul is going to deal with false teachers in a spiritual battle. He speaks of weapons, which is a common metaphor for Paul to use. He tells the Ephesians in that letter in detail about our weapons, the whole armor of God. He tells Timothy to fight the good fight. Here, Paul doesn't tell us what the weapons are, but he does describe them, showing their contrast to those political and fleshly uh, motives the false teachers were engaging in by attacking Paul's character and credibility. Go back and look at verse 3 again. We'll look at it in three parts. First, the first part, lofty things. Lofty things carries the idea of those things that have been built up. Just as a city builds up its walls to defend its inhabitants, the false teachers may have built up a following. They may have built up rumors. They may have built up discontent. They may have built up all manner of lies. But God will surely bring them down with the same power that crumbled the walls of Jericho. He warns the false teachers. In the second part of verse 3, he mentions taking captive. Remember, in the continuation of this war metaphor, what was normally done to a captive of battle. They were either imprisoned or executed. Sometimes, in the ancient world, they were not imprisoned or executed. They were often placed into service as slaves. Think of Daniel how he was taken captive and then trained to serve in the high courts of Nebuchadnezzar. They gave him a new name. They gave him a new education. Paul extends his wartime metaphor to include the redemption and sanctification of those who are in error. It is not at all Paul's intent to kill the, the false teachers, mar the false teachers, hurt the false teachers, it is his intention to try and to convert them. We need to remember this as we deal with false teachers today. We may need to create boundaries to our fellowship, but this is not to hurt others. This is hopefully to bring them to obedience. While we're out there battling for Christ, we're also recruiting. And then the third part of verse 3 Yet some will reject God's terms of personal surrender. Some will stand selfishly and prideful against love, mercy, and righteousness. Satan will have wrapped their hearts in deception, which they refuse to let that deception go. These will be punished. Still, with the hope of their repentance on, on the part of Paul and on the part of us as well when we try to go against those teaching false doctrine. It's for the good of the whole, however, that the boundaries of fellowship are created. Ephesians 6 tells us much more about those spiritual weapons. As we mentioned, it talks of the whole armor of God. But here in 2 Corinthians 10, we see what our spiritual war is really like. Let us not degrade into mudslinging. That would be wrong. But we need to always war with the weapons of righteousness for the salvation of our souls. Our weapons are different. They're heavenly. They originated in heaven. Their power comes from heaven. Their purpose comes from heaven, as we see in verse 4. And our winning is different. We're looking to destroy speculations, 
taking thoughts captive, getting others to be obedient to Christ, and, in the end, if needed, punishing disobedience. And now we'll go ahead and take the rest of the reading, verses 7 through 18, as Paul continues to answer his critics. Look what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are command, commending themselves but when, the me, when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others. But our hope is that your faith increases that it increases our area of influence among you, and it might be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another area, another's area of influence. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord, for it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. It appears that some of his critics did not believe Paul belonged to Christ in the same way they did. Were they thinking of him in his previous life as Saul of Tarsus, the arch persecutor of the church? Were they claiming to have special knowledge that the Holy Spirit had not given to Paul? Regardless, they were looking down on Paul and glorifying themselves. The problem then with arrogant Christians and the problem today with arrogant Christians is they feel that Christ belongs to them instead of the fact that they need to belong to Christ. It seems that some were taunting Paul about his personal appearance. They said he was weak looking and he was a poor public speaker and they might have been right, but these critics are confused. These opponents interpreted Paul's meekness as weakness, his forbearance as cowardice, and his gentleness as indecision. No one in the history of the Lord's church could have served Jesus with greater dependability and effectiveness than Paul the Apostle. Sinners must be convinced by the powerful message about Jesus and not be overpowered by mere human reasoning or overawed by sophisticated eloquence of a preacher. Apparently, they were accusing Paul of making boastful claims beyond his jurisdiction. They did not want him to th throwing his weight around in Corinth. But he answers, who brought you the gospel in the first place? I want to take a moment and share a paragraph with you from Melvin Curry's commentary on this book. Brother Curry says this, Today, Christ's authority is still expressed by the once-for-all revelation of his will through his ambassadors, the apostles. We must never allow human pride and wisdom to displace this authority. But as Paul pleads with the Corinthians to do, accept apostolic letters as the very word of God. This word comes with an irresistible challenge to everyone alike because of its divine origin. 
humble submission to Paul's authoritative word builds up and unites Christians in one body, while obstinate rejection of any of his ambassadors' messages breeds strife and division within the family of God. Well, they've leveled charges against Paul, but Paul levels his own charge. He would never compare himself to those that give themselves references of good character. Those types only measure themselves against themselves. They therefore had the wrong standard of measurement. We might be as good as the next person, but how do we stack up against Jesus Christ? Self-praise is no honor. Instead, we must strive for the Master's well done, my good and favor, favor, favored servant. Let me say it again. Well done, my good and faithful servant. What of Paul's authority in the Lord? When we look back at verses 7 through 11, we see Paul outlining the main points he intends to discuss in the next two chapters. He is Christ's true ambassador, he'll tell us in chapter 11. He exercises his full apostolic authority without shame, he'll tell us in chapter 11 and the first part of chapter 12. And he is as powerful in person as he is with his pen, he will tell us towards the end of chapter 12. We could call this Paul's Think About It Again section. He's giving his adversaries the opportunity to decide if they really want to continue in their critical line of thinking and their behavior. What a great sign of spiritual maturity that he will give them an opportunity to reconsider the facts before coming to, to deal with them harshly in person. It begins by Paul calling on the false teachers to carefully consider Paul's authority. If they believe Jesus is using them, then they must logically accept that Jesus may be using Paul as well. This is not just Paul asking them to consider their Christianity. This is Paul asking them to consider their commissions. Are they the apostle to the Gentiles? Are they really Christ's apostle at all? Because they are setting themselves up in that position and they're showing themselves openly by their behavior and accusations that they think they are Christ's apostles. Recognize that if you're aware that we are bold in our letters, Paul says, then be prepared for us to be just as bold when we show up because our letters are proof that we certainly can act, exercise what we in the modern day call tough love. Paul wants them to recognize that when absent, he communicates his boldness by his words, but when he is present, he communicates his boldness by his actions. While Paul's pulpit time may be meek and gentle, he is certainly an ambassador for Christ that knows how to take care of business. The Corinthians are to carefully consider what they know about Paul's deeds and these interlopers need to consider and think about the if they really want to fight this fight. Because Paul closes the paragraph with a request, a request for them to consider his deeds, he now reminds them of specific deeds he has in mind that will help them know what to expect when he arrives. He reminds them of their special bond. Remember, he founded their church, and therefore, he considers them his children in the Lord. Paul isn't trying to just keep up with the other religions in town. Paul isn't trying to, to class or compare himself with other ministers. He simply doesn't gauge his success on such a foolish scale. He doesn't measure his success by whether he can out-preach the guy down the street. He is above such foolish measurements. He's been entrusted with a very broad field to work in. Paul doesn't take credit for someone else's work. 
He hopes to continue to plant more churches even beyond Corinth. Paul's boasting isn't in the work he does for the Lord. His boasting is in the Lord for whom he works. We don't commend ourselves or puff ourselves up by measuring our success on a worldly scale or overstepping our bounds or taking credit for the work of others. Let's read two verses from Jeremiah chapter 9. Verse 23 and 24, Thus says the Lord, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. We will be tempted to commend ourselves. We'll be commended to consider our own wisdom, our own strength, and our own riches. The only approval that means anything is the Lord's to grant. He approves whom he commends. Paul said just about this exact same thing in 1 Corinthians 4, 2 through 5. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things that are now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purpose of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Catch this. The only approval that means anything is the Lord's to grant. He approves whom he commends. Let's talk about the proper news to spread. We need to talk about understanding and knowing God. We need to talk about the Lord's loving kindness, the Lord's justice, the Lord's righteousness, the things that the Lord delights in, the combination of grace, justice, and righteousness. Grace plus justice plus righteousness. People often understand one or the other, one of these three, or two of these three. But when you understand how all three factor into God's character, then you understand and then you know him. God desires to show grace and mercy towards us. But his justice requires sin to be punished. God alone determines what is righteous and God alone is righteous truly, perfectly righteous. Therefore, he sacrificed his own righteous son to satisfy his desire to exercise both grace and justice. All three traits operate in harmony, and this fullness is part of what makes our God such an awesome God that we would boast in his wonderfulness rather than in our own. Thanks again to my good friend Philip Shoemake for sharing some of his notes that he prepared quite a few years back on this book. And we've quoted from him broadly here in this lesson. Thank you for watching. I hope this study of 2 Corinthians is helpful in your own personal Bible study. And Lord willing, we look forward to studying with you again next week from chapter 11 of this book. Your support of the channel is greatly appreciated. Whatever you can do to help, please do it. The typical things that you can do to help are to subscribe to the channel, ring the notification bell, like or even dislike this video, and leave a comment. You can always get a hold of me 
personally at BibleClassTopics at gmail.com. Till we come together again, let's keep praying for each other. Let's keep praying for the world. And may God bless.